Hello and welcome. Today we have with us Naveen Kishore, the publisher of Seagull Books, this interview in a series of interviews that we've done on independent publishing in India. Thank you so much, Naveen, for your time. Um, I thought I'd begin with directly with a quote. I, I, I'm presuming that our readers or viewers know what Seagull Books is and does. But this interesting quote that I found in a profile on Seagull published uh, in uh, an Indian magazine, it says, and this is Anjum Katyal, your, uh, your author, saying, I think there is a complete lack of comprehension about what Seagull does. It has always been an outsider, its sensitivity international. She's obviously referring to uh, what Seagull does in Calcutta. But is Seagull really based in Calcutta? And if it is, what is it doing there? Why is it based there? Well, first, Anjum is not just an author and translator. She's, she was the Seagull editor for 19 years. Okay. Right. Uh, besides being a jazz rock blues singer that mm -hmm. I used to present even before publishing. Right. And one tiny little personal column ad would fill the hall because she was good. Okay. Um, I suspect what she, I mean, I'm not sure why she's saying this, quite honestly, but uh, Seagull is based in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. But Seagull is also based elsewhere. And the mm -hmm. elsewhere is a larger thing without trying to sound uh, silly about it. What we did very briefly in 2005 as a response to the rest of the world, the English speaking world, settling down in Delhi because mm -hmm. you and I speak the language, so we should be buying English books. Harper's, the Penguins, the Hatchets, the Bloomsbury's, you know, all of them. Mm -hmm. So we did a kind of, in retrospective, what seems like an act of politics, but I, at that point it was just tongue in cheek. So what if we were Seagull London, New York? Mm -hmm. What if we, our money was as good as everybody else's? What if the books looked better? All that would need is a reasonably courteous distribution. Mm. Because your authors need to be made visible. Sales as distinctly different from visibility. Mm. You have to make something visible for me to buy your book. So mm. that's the, provide that. Then why would we not be able to publish everybody from Picasso to Tony Morrison to Kentridge, whoever. That was the mm -hmm. logic. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that also was the chip we carried on our shoulder about the fact for 70 years you've been told that you as Indian publishers will buy the rights for within your country at best your mm -hmm. countries in terms of the you know, Nepal, right. Bangladesh, right. Pakistan. So, so we said no, we would always buy typically world rights for everything mm. because it is a globalized world and therefore we could be based anywhere. Right. You may live and design and produce and sustain yourself in Calcutta, um, but if you're doing good work, you can be based anywhere. That was the idea. Mm -hmm. So I set up a company called Seagull Books London Limited, incorporated there as an independent tax paying entity. Okay. Which the whole idea being there would never be an architectural reality or a staff reality, just mm -hmm. a part-time chartered accountant type person, a bank account, you pay your taxes. That is the company that is contracted with the Chicago University Press artist. Okay. And the relationship with the Calcutta company is completely autonomous at one level. Another level, it's one of servicing. You produce everything here. Mm. So what you're saying is that a book by a French author, a mm. French philosopher, is translated by somebody in the English world, sitting, mm -hmm. say, in America, or in France, or in England, at 90 pounds per thousand words, so you're competing with the world in that currency, right. sent to Calcutta, where it's designed, produced. It has a Shomnath Ho cover, because right. it fits. Mm -hmm. It's printed in America, often, okay. because I print in America, too, to save time, and travel anxiety of freight and shipment, which can be very fraught, to mm -hmm. meet Chicago deadlines. Right. So what I'm trying to explain is the practice of what you and I sometimes call globalization. That you're sort of calling that bluff too. Mm -hmm. Because in a culturally, you know, sort of fraught time, it's nice to be able to call bluffs in some right. kind of way. So she could possibly meaning that there is some confusion, not just in Calcutta. In fact, I think the confusion is more in Delhi. Right. Even earlier, not mm -hmm. now. It's 12 mm -hmm. years old, this experiment. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 500 books old since 2005, where you've got 500 books that you bought world rights for. Mm. The best of European literature, French lists, German, Italian, you know, Italian, yeah. Arab, you know. So, so the, there's huge uh, support and respect within the European community 
community. Community, yeah. Because you're also seen as that tiny little ray of hope. Because what has their relationship been with the English language shelves? Mm-hmm. which is American publishers in a sense, or British ones. It's been territories. You sell rights for UK, you sell rights for US. Mm-hmm. Those publishers know that you as a German playwright or author, author or whatever has a relationship with them so they can exercise the option. It can take four years for your book or six years. Mm-hmm. I just pick up the phone when I get excited of your new book and say I want to do this and I'm doing this using the same resources. Mm-hmm distribution networks, I can get into medical bookstores or whatever. I'm using the best translators. It's not being done in India and mm-hmm. where underpaid translators who may be Absolutely. very good, you know, do not mm-hmm. do this as a full time thing. So there are all kinds of things which appears as if there's no precedent for and which may well be true, but you're finding your way over the last twelve years into doing. So when she talks about an international sensitivity, mm-hmm. you're a publisher That's it. Mm. Indian, Japanese, Chinese is a birth thing and a sensibility thing, perhaps. But as so-called reading Indian readers or publishers or whatever, we're very comfortable in everybody's humors, for example. We don't Mm -hmm. get culture shock when we go to either Germany or Japan. Everybody else does when they come here. People often ask why European literature, because I grew up, you know, in a generation where all this literature was available. Right. Old man Rupa used to bring them across the college from Xavier's in a textbook store. You had the best of everything from translation mm-hmm. to new writing. There is a kind of cloning of a certain vision of an urban India. And of course, there are sub translations, but not enough from different mm-hmm. languages. But there's no world literature. Right. I grew up on, I, you know, I don't read the languages original. Mm-hmm. So when I, and it was always a place of hope for me, literature, particularly European literature, darker the better, was a kind of, for us non-Bible thumpers, it was a space of a certain kind of mm-hmm. opening to some pages and seeking out mm-hmm. a way out of your own despair through reading. And in fact, let me just stop you there. Uh, it, it wasn't just, I'm sure, literature. I mean, mm. uh, Siegel does not just publish books. No, no. So it, you have several other interests. And in, mm. you've, you, in fact, started from the theater. Mm. And I think you've come back to the theater uh, as a light designer for mm. Storm Still. Mm. So could you also talk a little bit about, say, not just in terms of publishing books, mm-hmm. but uh, uh, your growing up years, mm-hmm. when you were also in the theater, you were also doing, uh, like, managing the arts becoming a light designer and then also publishing books. So it sure. sort of seemed to be like, a, f- for me, who's like mm-hmm. much younger than you, mm-hmm. it, that time seems to be a very, very uh, happening place where, where mm-hmm. several things are happening. Mm-hmm. I think most times are happening places, it just mm-hmm. dis- depends on who's in sync or not. And I had to plunge into sort of making a living very early for, you know, my father lost his job for various reasons. And I just got into college and I was kind of, uh, in college, you're supposedly doing theater, if mm-hmm. you're that kind of person. And uh, I was very enamored of this wonderful man called Shumit Roy, who was part of the Red Curtain. He was their lighting designer, and I took more to him as a, a kind of mentoring thing. So it wasn't, I mean, I was always told I had a North Indian accent that I would be a disaster on stage, so stay away. Mm-hmm. So I became a backstage person. The lighting I took to naturally and enjoyed it. And as often happens in this country, you know, I self-taught often. There's one Mm -hmm. drama school still. Think about it. It's the reality of turning the hobby into making a living happen very quickly. To turn the living into something beyond the Beckett's and the Ionesco's and the serious theatre, which didn't bring in audiences, um, was where the impresario bit happened, what you call event managers today. But ICCR came, it was mandatory for you to work with the Indian Council for Cultural Relations as a cultural setup. Hmm. So if you were the American Center or the Arias Frances or the Goethe, you would have to bring your groups and hand them over to them. I see. see. Hmm. Before that, you handed it over to me. Okay. So that was what the event management thing where you charged an arm and a leg, mm-hmm. but you gave them everything. Mm-hmm. So if you had Macbeth coming from Cambridge Theatre Company, you provided Dhobi facilities and ironing. And, and I remember mm-hmm. in Rabindra Southern, which was a government theatre, mm-hmm. I actually used to pay 120 rupees per shift in those days for a staff of 18 to sit outside. Okay. So I could restaff it with efficient people to <laughs> do all these. So there were things you would right. improvise and learn. So theater beginnings, there was a reputation growing in terms of as an individual lighting designer person. 
But to feed that, because you often did things for free or at mm. 200 rupees, you did a whole play because they can't afford it. We couldn't afford it as they mm. So I turned to the advertising world. In those days, there were slide and sound and audiovisuals used to happen. So I became a, a, a sort of consultant that both clients and agencies liked because I would provide stage razzmatazz. Mm -hmm. You had a tea you were launching in the south of India. I would go to Taj Goromandel and for 400 salesmen for 20 seconds, uh, in those days charging 2,000 rupees, show you the magic of some kind of a large giant tea packet appearing mm -hmm. on somebody. You know, so you did all well and the money went into subsidizing. 10, 12 years of this activity led to the desire. You know, you've done Shamik Da, so mm -hmm. he was the first founding editor. We turned to him because he was like both drama critic and a mentoring presence in those days. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the possibility and he became for the first two years the uh, Siegel editor. And we did theater scripts. Mm -hmm. We did film because the one was documenting all this activity. Right. And so that also happened overnight in a sense through a, I'd organized a festival of grassroots theater movement and somebody was sitting on a front bench and madly sketching your body movement. So I turned to Shami there and said, this is going to be lost. Mm. This is before we took pictures. And you, mm -hmm. So you said, yeah, what a pity. The only way this to survive, somebody documented it. And I said, you know, we're called Seagull. People know us. Seagull books overnight, literally. <laughs> so we retired to some hotel. I think it was the Astor Lawn and we had okay. cars, And we formed June 20th, 82, literally set up the thing. I had no sense of scale, no money to fall back on. Mm -hmm. But you turned to sponsors who used to do your events. Right. So literally, you know, we did that and... That's how it started. Hmm. So just to yeah. round off the theater thing, hmm. it's it's um, it's something to me. It seems very organic when I look back, mm -hmm. but it's always been survival and less strategy. Strategy right. has been retrospective. Right. We did theater or later publishing, and uh, you know we did see ourselves as specialist niche publishers when we started documenting the theater, hmm. the film, the fine art, slightly off the beaten track stuff. And even the switching to a more international list of trying to play a first world publisher happened fairly, to me, fairly easily and organically. But sometimes it defies understanding because it is not mm -hmm. a model that everybody it follows. follows. Yeah, exactly. In fact, um, prior to, to the international list that you're talking about, in fact, even prior to that, you started the theater, the Seagull Theater Quarterly, which I, uh, I and sure. now you've archived everything mm -hmm. online and yeah. I've mm -hmm. sort of followed that very, very diligently. Sure. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's also, I don't know if this happens accidentally or in other ways, but mm. uh, there's a way in which, and I'll sp specifically talk about specific authors mm. now. Sure. And uh, so th there's this comment that I think uh, Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak says when she's discussing Seagull that uh, when you say, for instance, brought out Mahashita Devi, mm -hmm. and uh, you did not think of how she would be received within a particular space, say the Calcutta left tradition. But she says that uh, you saw Mahashita Devi for a, for a more international audience, how she might be read there. This is Gayatri? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so I, would you, what, what, how would you re react to that? And I do would, you? I mm. would think that, uh, you know, it's like every other activity that you and I indulge in. If we are that kind of personality, those responses are for your viewers, readers, uh, readers in the sense of the way you and I academically use the word read. Mm -hmm. um, I am in the throes of doing something. It's a practice. For me, the whole act of being seagull in a certain kind of way, all of us, is a practice, which mm -hmm. means you're doing. It's the process, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am responding to Mahashwata Devi on all aspects of it, the tactility of her, and I use the word deliberately, writing her personality, her way of being, uh, her ability to, you know, sit and just, you know, mm -hmm. caress your arm while talking, to um, her activism, certainly, mm -hmm. her ability to reach out every time there's a problem and actually throw her body into the fray. I'm not thinking left, right? Okay. My left is an imbibed left. I may not be a party carrying member, nor am I a disappointed mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I practice a certain kind of way of being social and human mm -hmm. as an intuitive trained thing. Mm -hmm. As to some other wonderful people, the Shomnath Hose, the Mira Mukherjee's, all of these people moved away according to the left, but they spent their entire lives in the community doing precisely mm -hmm. what had attracted them to that to, way to, to of that life. tradition. Not yeah. even an ideology mm -hmm. or a philosophy, but a way of being mm -hmm. human. 
So if we are questioning the powers that be, which happened in mm -hmm. pre this strange Calcutta thing that we are now in, was you weren't rejecting the left, you were requesting introspection and you were, you, right. know, you would, mm -hmm. like, like the Judith Butler's of the world did to the bushes of the world, saying, don't mm -hmm. go bombing people after 9 11 and the mm -hmm. mountains and the caves and shut your borders if you must and just think within your heads, mm -hmm. why is this happening? Mm -hmm. No one does that enough, right? We right. do it as individuals and so on and so forth. But the Mahashwata Di was a relationship like everything else. And I can give you countless examples of wonderful relationships mm -hmm. where you said something instinctively earlier about publishing, not just books. It's true. We don't just publish books. We publish authors. You stay with mm -hmm. them, right? So Mahashwata Di was not a strategy. It was both an encounter, a life-changing one, and, uh, you know, so you did her work in its totality. And we're mm -hmm. still catching up and carrying on and doing and inventing right. ways of making her work and mm -hmm. life more visible. But it wasn't an either or thing. How do mm -hmm. you set out to be doing? She wasn't even introduced into the international market except through foreign languages that were not English, but European right. ones. Mm -hmm. um, we had no, I mean, people came and wanted to translate it in Japanese and you know, Swedish and German and French. It was no special effort. It was also pre-2005, so I couldn't even say I was distributing her through Chicago. I had no reach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for Gayatri to say that, it could well be that Gayatri Di had first been the one who toured, represented in the nicest possible way, wrote about, translated. Some of those got done by polity and things. Mm -hmm. We negotiated it, but it was random. Now, more concretely, she right. gets there like any other author. You do not consciously translate an author for a particular milieu. Mm -hmm. You translate them because in any case, it's for the human condition. So if some small town in Germany or in Perulia is too rigid for you as a French author to translate till you read the thing and say, gosh, this mm -hmm. works because it is the human condition that goes, not the geographical one. So our truth is that there is no strategized truth. It's, it's a practice. I don't know if that makes any mm -hmm. sense or if it sounds romantic. And that's the other thing. It is romantic and I'm perfectly yeah. comfortable with the romance of doing what it is because there's a price to be paid, right. which you pay like you do for your daily necessities. You know, you mm -hmm. want to wear a certain shirt or drink a glass of single malt or whatever. In the same way, I want to make the book that is part of a wish list of the four or five of us who do things. So then everything is broken down to logistics and that's where your theater training comes. Right. Everything mm -hmm. is a project that you can execute, mm -hmm. be good at executing. Oh, you're but damn good at yeah, that. Yeah, kind of. <laughs>